Okay, welcome back to Linux Music One, and this week we're going to look at pulse code modulation, how digital music works, bit depth, sample rates, what's it all mean, how's it important to you, uh, pulse code modulation being slicing up a, a signal and measure, measuring each slice. And which is basically the foundation of all music uh, that you hear, whether it be streaming through your Spotify or your iTunes, uh, what's sitting on your your phone or your when you play a CD, any of those, uh, they're all they're all pulse code modulation. Uh, so first, a little bit of history. Uh, the the idea is not new. Back in 1853, a guy named Moses Farmer uh, did some time division of of signals. Uh, so he could multiplex them for telegraph machines. So he basically sliced up uh, telegraph beeps or whatever they do on telegraphs in, into slices, uh, mixed them together, sent them down a wire, and that way uh, a wire could carry more than one uh, telegraph message. And uh, 50 years later, a guy did uh, named Miner did the same thing with uh, reading these pulses, what were their ampl uh, amplitudes, and modulating it uh, in 1920. Uh, Bartholomew Farlane actually used uh, punch paper tapes to transmit images. Uh, so, so kind of a precursor to a fax machine that was invented six years later, but never put into production where they would read uh, the, the darkness or lightness of a... Uh, of, uh, piece of paper, uh, send that darkness or lightness in bits of ones and zeros down a, down a wire, receive it, turn it back into punches, and uh, or not punches, but dark dots, and transmit an image. And in 1943, they actually recorded audio, voices, uh, put them through some type of transform equations, whatever, to encrypt them so that they couldn't be uh, decrypted and sent that out over wires. And then all the way up to 1946 when Oliver and Shannon patented and are generally uh, considered to be the inventors of pulse code modulation. And we're going to, we're going to see what that is. We use almost everything we use today is linear pulse code modulation. And I'll, I'll show you what the linear means. Uh, but if, if you think about it, the, the most basic Digital music is is a wave file, and you've heard of wave files and broadcast wave files, and they were developed uh, by IBM and Microsoft, and they both use linear pulse code modulation. Uh, broadcast wave is nothing except a, a wave with more dat metadata, like what's the name of the song, or who's the artist, or some other information. But both of them are nothing more than Slicing up a, a signal, uh, a speaker kicks a transducer uh, a certain amount, and it measures how much did it kick, and takes a digital measurement and records that. And wave is nothing except chunks of digital numbers and uh, some header data that says, okay, well, we're using 16-bit numbers, and... Uh, a chunk has 5,000 numbers in it, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a, a wave is nothing except uh, chunks of linear pulse code modulation data with a little bit of header information that says, you know, how to read it. Is it is it 8-bit signals? Uh, is it 16-bit signals? Is it how, how many signals in a chunk, et cetera, et cetera? And generally, for, for all intents and purposes, uh, linear pulse code modulation is considered to be lossless. Uh, we'll, we'll see why, depending on bit depth and, and sample rate and some other things. But in general, uh, we believe that the original signal, the original analog signal, with sufficient uh, measurements and sufficient uh, uh, quantification, uh, quantization, uh, the size of the measurement, how, how many how closely, accurately you can measure that you can recreate that signal uh, precisely back to what it was. So let's let's take a look at that. Here is, as we've seen many, many times before, 
in previous videos is a is a regular sine wave, uh, pretty boring, but here is a is a dobro wave, and let me plug here that dobros are not boring at all. Dobros are very very cool. So let's hear that. Now if we zoom in on this dobro wave and grab just a hundredth of a second, you see that's a pretty complex wave, uh, real complex compared to a sine wave. And it's got all these artifacts that, you know, we've, we've discussed at great length in other videos. So let's take this, and as an example of linear pulse code modulation, let's divide it up. And we're going to read a whole bunch of samples. We're going to read it here, 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 through the course of time. And we're going to measure how much that signal is. So we'll slice it up. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, that would tell us that we can, well, eight, but uh, three bits, uh, three binary digits. In, in binary numbers, you can have zero to seven uh, represented uh, zero, uh, z from zero, zero, zero to one, one, one. And so this would be a three bit sample. Let's, let's take a look. Yeah, okay. Three bits, and if you count these up and multiply a hundredth of a second, it's about 1,900 measurements per second, or 1.9 kilohertz. Three bits, and if I measure right here, that's the closest. Measure here, that's the closest. Measure this slice, that's the closest. Measure this slice, that's the closest. You can see I kind of loosely follow the shape of that wave. Uh, and, and if I was playing this back and recreating it, this, the red line, is what you'd hear. And it's not too accurate at three bits at 1900 kilohertz. But let's, let's measure a little closer. Oh, by the way, the linear in, uh, the, the linear part of linear pulse code modulation is the fact that these are all the same, these measurement indicators are all the same size. You could have, presumably logarithmic pulse code modulation or something else, but linear means we're measuring exact each each measurement from one to the next is is the same size. So here we go. If we listen to this back you wouldn't think it would sound too much like like a dobro. But if we did the same thing and we took it to four bits, which is sixteen possible values this way and we bump up the, the number of measurements a little bit to 4,300 measurements per second, you see we're, we're getting a little closer. I measure here, measure here, measure here, and again, I, only, I can only measure at intersections, but I'm more or less creating that waveform. Let's bump it up some more. Four bits again. But I'm, I've doubled the rate. I'm taking 8,600 measurements per per second. Notice how closely I can represent that wave. Now, if if we took this and instead of eight, by the way, let me point out that 8.6 kilohertz with 8-bit resolution is uh, considered standard in voice communications like. Uh, when you have a, a VoIP phone or your Skype or, or whatever uh, standard telephon telephony uh, operations uh, use 8 bits and uh, 8,000 uh, measurements per second. And that's, and you know, you've, you've talked on those things. You, you hear, hear a voice pretty well. But let's think about a CD. A CD is 16 bits, and it's 44 0.1 kilohertz, so 44,100 uh, measurements per second, and uh, 16 bits gives us instead of 16 here, it gives us over 65,000 uh, possible values, and that is is really really uh, close, and that and that's why we consider if we can measure uh, a value uh, to a one hundred six one. 65,000 and do it uh, 44,100 times a second that we can really recreate this wave exactly as it as it sits here no matter what its complexity is. Uh, 
there's there's a theorem uh the nyquist theorem says you know you if you can measure uh the, the highest frequency a, a human can generally hear is 20,000 and as you get older or a lot of uh say dead shows uh then then that will decrease your high end starts to go but uh, but uh, a new human a teenager that hadn't worn his his earplugs too much can hear up to 20,000 hertz and Nyquist says as long as we're double that, uh, we can recreate that uh, without it, uh, additional artifacts and, and measure it to all necessary uh, levels of accuracy. So that's why, you know, uh, twice that's 40,000 times a second. So you've got uh, anything over uh, 40,000 times a second is going to recreate that pretty closely. We... Uh, we have different bit depths for different things. You might, uh, old game controllers, Nintendos, those used four or eight bit sounds. Uh, we, uh, now you often get digital audio workstations where they go to 24 bits or recorders at 24 bits or 32 bits. And for some of that, uh, there's a good value in it. it as particularly in a digital audio workstation, we take these measurements, and let's say we're using 32-bit and an incredibly high level of accuracy, and we're going to do a lot of math on it uh, every time we add an effect, uh, be that reverb or uh, limiting or whatever. That's basically arithmetic on these numbers, and we want that arithmetic to be really close, uh, give a greater level of accuracy so that when we eventually downsample to 16 bits, because we will probably downsample it to 16 bits, most most audio projects are put out in, in CD quality audio, so we will record it and measure it and do all our arithmetic operations at 32 bits or 24 bits and then finally downsample it to 16 bits that we haven't through through these many operations in the digital audio workstation, uh, adding the effects, etc., uh, lost important pieces of information just from the repeated uh, mathematics on it. Similarly, there's there's lots of wars in audio equipment about how fast should we be sampling. Is 44.1 uh, what it is? Is it should it be 48 kilohertz, 96, 192? Uh, 384, who knows. Uh, but the general consensus is, uh, with the current limitations of electronic equipment, uh, that the 96 is about the best you can go. Uh, that, that anything above that introduces its own artifacts just from the act of measuring into the signal, and doesn't mean you wouldn't like 384, 384, the artifacts it introduces might be very pleasing to your ear, but that we are getting, uh, once again, where we've pulled on the other side and are now uh, not sampling to the appropriate uh, rate. So right now, uh, CD quality audio, as you can see, if we could uh, make the 65,000 possible uh, values and five times as many measurements we would be getting really close cd quality is is very close to what your ear hears whether or not you know you've got that whole only analog or only digital uh, i think most people consider that that analog does sound better but it's not necessarily because of the quality of the measurement going into it that it's because of artifacts, uh, warm noise that's going into it, those kind of things. So here, there you go. Uh, and by the way, why is it 44.1? Uh, Herbert von Karajan was uh, a big-time European composer, a favorite of Sony Music's uh, president, and back in the day at 48 kilohertz or a uh, slightly smaller CD size, Beethoven's Ninth would not fit on a single CD, and he threatened to pull out of the 1981 announcement of, of hey, we've invented CDs. You're, you know, you're going to live happily ever after, and they couldn't have him pulling out, and so they, they changed the specs so that 
Beethoven's Ninth Symphony would fit entirely on a on a single CD, and that's the rumor. I don't know how accurate that is because I think uh, they've determined since that at 48 kilohertz, you could still fit Beethoven's Ninth on a CD or the original proposed size, but that's what I always heard. So anyway, that's it for this week. Linear pulse code modulation, the basics of uh, everything we're listening to these days, unless you're unless you're doing a back porch thing uh, or a live performance music, virtually everything you hear is digital music or has been through a, some type of digital uh, stage. And the, the basics for all digital music is linear pulse code modulation, nothing more than taking a whole bunch of measurements at some some specified uh, level accuracy, dumping it all onto a disk or a hard drive or something like that, and then reading it back. And usually when it, when it dumps it, on the hard drive, it, it keeps it itself in in wave format that you know tells it I'm using 16-bit numbers, 24-bit numbers, 32-bit numbers, and here's how big it is in a chunk. So that's it for this week. Uh, I hope in future weeks we'll do a little less of this uh, audio consumer thing and get back into the audio creator thing. But but hopefully this you've learned something here. So that's oh wait one more thing. If you think about it, right now we're measuring audio and how much a speaker and a microphone kicks on or off, uh, and, and a transducer measures that. But it doesn't have to be audio. Uh, wave format and uh, LPCM data is used for lots of things besides audio. It could be uh, measuring an electronic circuit in, uh, in uh, some type of circuit design on a motherboard. It could be a barometric pressure reading, a temperature reading, uh, basically anything that is an analog reading that kicks on a, a transducer to take a digital measurement of that reading with a, with a defined period of time can be put into, into PCM format. So, we could have barometric readings, and maybe they're only accurate to uh, four bits. And maybe instead of 8.6 kilohertz, you're only measuring once per second, so it's it's one hertz. Uh, uh, either way, though, you if this isn't confined to audio. You can use PCM for anything that goes from the analog to the digital world in a in a structured set of measurements. So, okay, well that's it for this week, and we'll see you, we'll see you next week.